A.R.E. Podcast, episode number four. Welcome to the, Welcome to the A.R.E. Podcast. A.R.E. Podcast. Where it's all about encouraging and inspiring you today so you can fulfill your dream of becoming a licensed architect tomorrow. And now your host, he owns a 1956 Airstream travel trailer, David Doucette. Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of the ARE Podcast. And yes, I do own a 1956 Airstream travel trailer that uh, I've owned since 2006. And uh, I've been slowly, slowly restoring it. But it's very cool because it's, for all intents and purposes, it has all the systems a house does. So, but seven years later, I'm still working on it. But that's not what we're talking about today. You really call that working on it? <laughs> as much as like an architect works on something, you know, when an architect physically has to use, you know, his or her hands to, to physically do something. Yeah, that's that's working on it. You know, what you need is you need a deadline. That's what you need. And that'll get that'll kick you in the gear. I need to some I need someone to do it for me. That's what I need. Well, that too. <laughs> you know, we're architects. We're good at finding somebody else to do stuff for us. Right. <laughs> Uh, as always, we're joined by our, our beautiful co-host out there in Palm Springs who has a new haircut to show off today. Yeah, I apologize. <laughs> it's a, Eric, little, a little too short. <laughs> Eric Corey Freed, who, by the way, is the one who found our topic for today. We are going to talk all about dating tips for dating architects, and this is coming from uh, I just lost the article. Where did it go? <laughs> it's coming from a guy who's married and another guy who's not not no married, longer, not, no longer married. Yeah, I know. So this is this is we are authorities on dating architects. So, <laughs> um, and Eric, you found the article, so I'm I'm putting all this blame on you. So where did you find it? Uh, I found it uh, in uh, either Flipboard or Prismatic. It's one of those aggregators, which, by the way, is a great great little free tool. You go, you know, you set up an, an account for free. You put in the topics that interest you, and it gives you a, a daily news feed of of what you want. It's almost like a magazine tailored just to you. And as you can imagine, my topics are pretty nerdy, so I have things like three D printing and um, and uh, you know um, contour crafting and and uh, sustainability and all that other stuff. And then one of the articles that came up in the feed was just about general, you know, I guess architects and this idea of you know tips on dating an architect. And I sent it. I sent it to my wife, and you know she enjoyed it. So I thought, well, maybe this is maybe maybe we should talk about this. <laughs> Did she agree with it? <laughs> well, the first, her, her, the first thing she said was, uh, "Are you trying to tell me you're dating now? Is that how you're telling me?" <laughs> right. And I said, "No, but you know, you get the point." Uh, and she agreed with pretty much all of it. it it's a funny list, and uh, it's from the date report and written by the author Julian J. Last year, I have no idea what the date report is. I have no idea who Julian J is. Um, but we're going to talk about, um, I, in fact, I don't know if Julian is a, a, a boy or a girl here. Um, so we're going to talk about their list. I think if it's an E, it's a girl. If it's a I A N, it's a boy, but I don't know. I don't know. I'm not as worldly as you. <laughs> That's one of the points actually about how worldly we can be. All right. So we're going to go through the nine list. It's called Nine things they don't tell you about dating an architect. We thought we'd have a little fun here because we just uh, are coming off launching our programming, planning, and practice ultimate whole enchilada package. So we need a little fun here. Uh, we need a little bubblegum talk. All right. So the first one on the list is architects make a lot of money. And then her comment on it is this is not true, but people assume it is. So Right off the bat, number one is an assumption out there that we as architects make a lot of money. Eric, is that true? Well, it, no, unfortunately, it's not true. But if, you, if you're going to have assumptions put upon you, that's a good one. I mean, if I'd rather that they think that we do make a lot of money and we don't than, than thinking that we're you know, idiots when we're not or something. You know, it's, it's kind of a good thing to be assumed for. Uh, but 
you know, it, it's funny. You'll meet people and they'll go, ooh, an architect. <laughs> That's Usually there's some noise that comes out of their mouth. And I think in their, it, it's nice that they kind of hold us in the same esteem, esteem as doctors or attorneys. But unfortunately, we don't get we we just don't get paid the same. And by the way, that's a whole other topic because I I think that's really our collective faults that we don't get paid the same. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, but so so being an architect, I guess, can be really good for getting the first date and maybe yeah. even the second date. But once they figure out that oh you don't make a lot of money, then then you know it's all downhill from there. I guess when you show up on the date with a coupon, that's probably not a good good sign. <laughs> Um, and then I guess, uh, you know, sleepless in Seattle, of course, Tom Hanks playing the architect. I have no idea. I haven't seen that movie in years, uh, but what his sort of financial sort of situation was or is in that movie, but it worked for Meg Ryan. Yeah. Well, he lived on a houseboat. Oh, so, okay. So he, it couldn't have been that great. And he, and it looked like he was a, uh, somewhat of a principal at his firm. So he was probably doing well enough to live in Seattle. Well, but, I lived what? I lived on a sailboat for six weeks um, a couple years ago, and uh, it did nothing for the dating life. <laughs> <laughs> Just FYI. Right. Well, that might not have been the boat, though. It might have been something, <laughs> something else. Yeah, you know, it was an older boat, so, you know. Anyway. All right. So, number one, we can disagree with architects don't make a lot of money. That's, you know, it's a shame because you, your clients, you know, generally are are fairly well to do. And in in a certain sense it's a little unfair because we're socially we're keeping up with them. You know, we're going to dinners with them, we're attending the same clubs and events and things, but they're you know, they're much more comfortable financially than than we generally are. Well, you know, it's funny, it's the it's the whole uh it's the whole uh the saying goes about, you know, a cobbler's kid has no shoes. You know, right. it's like we design these great houses uh, and, you know, many of us aren't fortunate enough to live in the types of houses that we design. Granted, there are some of us who do, um, but as a whole, not a whole lot of us get to, you know. Um, so, uh, but, I mean, I don't want to poo-poo too much the profession. There is money to be made. I mean, I think, you know, project managers in a respectable architectural firm are, you know, making $80,000 a year, something like that, maybe more. Um, but but when we compare it to doctors uh, and lawyers who make a you know a lot more than that, it's kind of a you know we're not up there. Yeah, or or a guy doing C plus plus at Google is making one twenty a year. Yeah, exactly. Right out of school, probably too. Right. Um. All right, but that is a whole whole another uh, podcast episode. Okay, so number one, we don't agree with. Uh, number two. Architects are used. Are, architects are used to late nights, and the description here is: in theory, it shouldn't be a problem to stay up all night for sexy time. But in reality, <laughs> they probably pulled an all-nighter last night and are ready to crash at eight tonight. Yeah, this is this. I you know I um my wife teases me because I I end up taking naps because I was up till working till three a.m. and getting up at eight for a meeting. So. uh yeah, we're we uh, in one sense we do have great stamina, but we tend to not use it on fun things. We tend to use it on <laughs> we tend to use it on building that chipboard model that we had to finish, <laughs> or or in this case, you know, writing an exam study guide. You know, that is the funniest thing you have said in a while about we do have great stamina, but we just don't sort of put it to the best use, I guess, in terms of what dating people might think of our uh, stamina as being. That's pretty funny. Well, it's unfortunately it's true, but uh, yeah, I you know uh, um, I don't sleep a lot. You know, I, I I'm a night owl. I go to bed late. I wake up early, uh, and I'm I really like sleep too. But I just don't I just don't can't afford to do it. Well, what's funny is so number two is definitely true. We're used to late nights. They condition us that in architecture school, and you know, pulling the the infamous all-nighter, you know, and, and people who aren't in architecture school look at us like, oh my God, you're going back to the studio? It's 11 o'clock. You know, we're like, yeah, I gotta, you know, I gotta finish this thing. Would you forget some pizza or something? What are you, what are you, going, what are you going back to the studio for? No, I'm going to work for another six hours. <laughs> but I will tell you, um, nowadays, an all-nighter for me is the equivalent of staying up till 1230. So I'm just, I'm just putting that out there. 
I will say that my recovery time once I hit once I passed forty, my recovery time for an all nighter was much higher because I used to be able to do an all nighter and then just get a normal night's sleep the next night. Now I do an all nighter and I'm wrecked for the for the next four days. Which which is exactly what this number two says. It says you know they pulled an all nighter but they're uh, they're ready to crash at eight eight p.m. the next night. You know. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I I I remember in studio we had we actually had a big board up of the number of hours and and there was always a current record holder of who went the longest without sleep. You know, and we had like a big sign, like it was made out of cardboard, of course, but we'd have a big sign. And I remember my buddy Darren had 56 hours in a row that he was the record holder. And nobody broke that record till for a long time. But he, you know, was kind of insane. And I remember his legs were shaking and his, <laughs> like he couldn't even stand, he couldn't even function. I don't even know how he got back to his dorm, quite frankly. It was 56 hours is, it's a long time to go without sleep. And you, you, you just go nuts. I remember back in architecture school, and and again, I went to the BAC where we worked for a real firm during the day. We made real money. Uh, We went to school at night and on the weekends, which obviously they still do there. Um, But I remember pulling a few all-nighters and having to go to work, you know, at (laughs) nine o'clock in the morning, and it was not a uh, it was not a good day uh, at work. You'd sort of just (laughs) sit at your desk and try and look busy when the boss would walk by, but that's about all you know you could do. Yeah, the be- the best thing you could have done that is at least shower, so that way when you walk in, they don't know that you pulled an all nighter right away. You know, because right. sometimes you'll have cardboard glued to your face. You know, <laughs> I remember, uh, you know, I was I was working and going to school at the same time, and I pulled an all nighter, and I I just couldn't keep awake, and I went into the conference room, and I thought I'm going to take a 20 minute nap, and I didn't know where to nap, so I crawled. Believe it or not, I crawled underneath the conference room table. And I fell asleep, and it was. And I told a buddy of mine to wake me up in twenty minutes, and he forgot. And three hours later, I woke up when I started seeing knees come into under the table, and I'm trapped under the table, not knowing how to escape with some important client that's in the meeting room, you know. And I'm, I'm like, how am I going to see? You know, it was like a Lucille Ball episode all of a sudden. Like, how am I going <laughs> to, how, how am I going to get out from under this conference table without looking like a total ass? <laughs> Uh, by the way, your friend didn't forget to tell you. He just didn't want to tell you, just to <laughs> yeah, break it exactly. to you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> There's no way I would have told you to wake up after 20 minutes. <laughs> exactly. Uh, all right. So number two is true. We're used to late nights, and we enjoy them. Uh, number three, there is no such thing as a fat architect. And the commentary hit is, for some reason, I have no idea. That's what she says about this so there's no such thing as a fat architect what do we say there uh yeah mo- most of them are pretty fat i mean i'm i'm <laughs> i'm uh i'm i'm working on it but uh you know i plan on fattening up pretty pretty big when i get older <laughs> and uh and then even there's even a great movie called the belly of an architect which uh i forget the guy who plays it brian dennehy brian dennehy but he's a pretty pudgy stout guy and he's always like holding his ulcer and his big fat gut and uh you know, uh, think you know. Frank Gehry is on the portly side. Michael Graves kind of on the portly side. I remember um, being in architecture school and again going to school in Boston. You know, H. H. Richardson was was uh, you know was one of the guys we studied because a lot of his his Romanesque architecture was there. But I remember the the instructor putting up the slide of H. H. Richardson. And he's he was a big guy, and his all he said he pulls up the slide and he goes, "Now this is a man who liked his groceries." And I just well, I, yeah, I think, you know I think we like the finer things, and I think food is among them. Most of most of my architect friends are kind of uh, kind of like uh, snobby foodie types. You know they they take stupid Instagram photos of the things they're eating. I mean they they like to eat well, and they like beautifully designed good things around them. So they tend to be um, well fed. They're not a you know, my students are, they're, they're, they're skinny, but, <laughs> but once they hit 30, boy, they, you know, they pound up nicely. Well, it's all that money we're making when the cash rolls in, we can just, you know, buy all the food we want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think it's also working late nights. So, you know, I worked a late night last night and, uh, there were Trader Joe's Oreos just ne- <laughs> ne- next to me. <laughs> and, uh, 
you know, it's it's fuel. It's keeping me going. <laughs> yes, it is. It is fuel. Sugar, they call that, actually. Right. But, uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, all right. So number three, there is no such thing as a fat architect. That one is false. Number four, things you never knew even existed are now the most important thing ever. And the commentary here is that is the ugliest effing radiator ever. How do they not align the light switch with the outlet? What's your favorite kind of hinge? And what's your favorite CAD command? So what do we say about this one? This is, you know, my my, uh, my poor wife has to deal with a lot of stuff like this. You know, I I have this thing that I, on, this, on the switch plate covers, I want all the screws to be horizontal. So I go back with the screwdriver. When we move into a place, I go back and I, I turn them so they're all horizontal. Is that, I don't know if that's OCD or what, but I just, I like it. And it bothers me if it's not, if they're not, yeah, that 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 actually is the next one, number five. They're probably anal. I think that's is what that fall. <laughs> well, that you know, it's uh, but I only have to do it once, right? But then you know, like we, um, you know, uh, in in laying out the house, my my wife, of course, she's got a lot of ideas and input because it's her house. But I keep shooting them down because no, we got to get the right type of shelf and we got to get the right type of bracket. And, yeah, I, I would imagine it's tough. Um, being married to an architect, um, I mean, I'm not married anymore, but I, I've never fully understood two architects being married together. I mean, that has to be hard because, you know, somebody's always going to want the dominant sort of, you know, opinion or the voice in the relationship. There's a lot of those too. A lot of, yeah. you know, uh, you know, Venturi and Scott Brown are the kind of the most famous couple, but I have a lot of friends that are architect couples and their house looks great, but I don't know how they agreed on anything. <laughs> right. I mean, we see it working with clients, you know, just trying to get a, just a, let's call them a normal couple to agree on stuff is very difficult. So right. to, to try and get two architects who are married to agree on, you know, what piece of furniture they want to put in their living room. I mean, it's got to take months for that decision to, to, to come about because, you know, we overthink things. And I don't know if that's part of architecture school, uh, you know, if we can blame that or not. Well, you know, there's, there's also, uh, because we're poor, relatively speaking, it's, we, you know, I, I've noticed this because this happens in my house, but it happens in a lot of my friends' houses, is that we'll have this one beautiful object that we spend a lot of money on. <laughs> right. Like I, here, like I have, I'll show you. I have this, um, I have this Alessi bowl, which I love. Right. It has no function. And it costs more than it should, right. but it's it's this beautiful cast cabbage leaf in in, pu- in silver or pewter or something, and I just love it. I love to look. It brings me happiness to look at it every day in my <laughs> office. But it was, you know, I probably skipped a meal in order to pay for it. You know what I mean? It's a little weird. Well, yeah, that that's your little thing that makes you feel like I'm making it as an architect, like I'm living sort of in the architect, and it can hold your Trader Joe's cookies. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't dare put the cookies in there, but it could. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Uh, yeah, we, we, uh, it's got to be difficult to, to be in a relationship with us or, or married to us because we do. We like think about everything. I mean, there's just things I think about that, um, that other people don't even, it's not even, they don't even think about, they don't even, un, they don't even know whatever it is, it's there. Like they probably don't even realize, like to use your example, a light switch has screws. I mean, they just never thought, I didn't even know a light switch had screws, and now you want them, you know, all the little things to be horizontal. Of course, until right. we use, you know, but of course, for our clients, we use concealed, um, you know, switch plate covers, so you, obviously you don't see the screws. Yeah, but the nice thing is, as an architect, we can usually get one of something for free. So I could call Lutron and probably get one of their little $85 glow-in-the-dark. <laughs> right. But I could only get one, but right. I, I could probably get it, and then... I would want to install that in a special spot somewhere in the because we only have the one. Right. So I'd probably want to put it somewhere that I'd use it every day. <laughs> All right. So number four seems to be true. And now number five, they're probably anal. So a little bit of commentary here. Um, they probably have one of three systems for organizing their bookshelves by color, by size, such as largest to smallest, by publisher. None of these make any sense and ironically provide the very opposite of order, but it doesn't matter because it looks better. 
In fact, they will have a system for everything, including organizing the fridge and how to put their clothes away. You might think it's cute at first, an endearing quirk, until you realize how much of their precious little free time is consumed by obsessing over things that A, no one cares about, and B, does not enhance their lives in any way. See, I do care, and it does enhance my life, so you're, <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> uh, so number five, they're probably anal, with, right off the bat, true or false? Well, anal, is, anal uh, sounds... Uh, no, 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 true or false, right off the bat. I say false. Oh, I think we're, uh, no. we're attention to detail. That's it. It's not. That's yeah. kind of being anal. Anal, anal sounds. Yeah, anal sounds like you've got it. Like you should be taking medication. No, nah, that I would have to definitely. <laughs> this one is definitely true because we are. I think you know. I, I admit it. I'm. There's certain things that I have to have uh, a certain way. Yeah, I, I know. I've been working with you. <laughs> But uh, like I, for instance, here's here's why. Because as as nutsy as I think I am, I've got friends that are way nutsier. You know, are I, they architect I, friends or non architect? Well, friends? yeah, they are architect friends. But I do. <laughs> I, I have a, I have a friend who she organized her books by color uh, to create this beautiful range. It goes from you know Roy G. Biv. It just goes right. the whole range, and they yeah, it looks cool. I don't know how she'll ever find a book ever again. Quite frankly, yeah, that's, exactly. That's that's nuts to me. Because I, I, I grouped them by topic. And I, the books, though, are a bit of a sore subject because every time we've moved, we've you know had about 800 pounds of books to move with it. And half the moving truck is books. Right. And my, my, I have to kind of re-explain this to my wife why I need these, need these books around me. And what's your explanation? I just, I say, I just need them. They're my precious. You know, I need them. <laughs> and, I, yeah, I can't explain it. <laughs> and then, and then, she, you know, then she's logical and normal. So she'll say, well, if you haven't opened the book in the last year, you know, get rid of it. But I can't. I mean, I've tried, but except for, except for novels, if it's an architecture book, I'm not getting rid of it ever. Right. Right. And so, yeah, that, I guess that does make us a little anal. We're definitely anal. I mean, there's just things that I overthink of, uh, I just overthink about. And I think normal people just don't think more than, I, I think normal. See, an, anal, an anal person would have turned off their ringer before the podcast. Yeah, I know, but I hardly get calls. So the fact that I actually happen to get a call while we're podcasting is very rare. Yeah. Uh, uh, on my cell phone, that is. But, um, I think there's just like for, you know, the MacBook Retina I just bought, which I have research, I, you know, I've waited for over a year to make that purchase and research and overthought. And then, of course, I make it. And then, you know, three weeks later, they come out with a refresh, which, you know, I'm still getting over because you only get 15 days to return it. But, right. um, but uh, all right. So anal is 100% true to me. I'll, uh, true for me. Uh, I'll admit it, and I'll I'll give you a, a not true on that one. But I think you're you're you're, you're closeted anal over there, <laughs> if we could say such things. Sure. Uh, all right. Number six. After a while, you will only hang out with other architects, and the commentary is: This happens. Hope you don't just love your architect, but but that you love love all architects. And keep in mind, this article is written for somebody who's going to date an architect. So this person is telling the person who's going to date an architect that you are going to hang out with architects, basically only. What do you say to that? Well, you know, I, when I was dating, and even with my wife, I did hear often, you know, I never met an architect before. And now I know 12 of them. <laughs> you know, like suddenly they, they tap into a whole goldmine of, of architect friends. And I do, I do have a fair amount of architect friends. I, I admit it. And uh, um, I, yeah, it's probably true. We shouldn't be hanging out with each other, though. I mean, we're technically competition to each other. We should be hanging out with rich white people. So we should be hanging out with. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you really, if you really think about it, that's who we should. We should be hanging out with. You know, people who play squash. You know, I, th I, I think um, we still are a bit uh, of a rare breed because I remember, you know being in Boston and telling people that, you know, I'm an architect or, and, and people would be like, wow, I don't know any architects, you know? So we still are a little bit uh, of a rare breed. We're not as common as sort of doctors uh, and lawyers, but yeah, I think once you're sort of in our circle, then like you said, it's like, yeah, now you know, you know, 12 architects, you know? 
Right. And, and also, you know, like, uh, some of our best friends are contractors like they're that, you know, who else do you meet? Right. I think that, I think that's why architects get married. If, if not, not just because they have a lot in common, but, but also who else are they going to meet? <laughs> they're working late nights, you know? I, it is true. I mean, architects work a lot, which is maybe another show topic, but we're ingrained in architecture studio to work a lot. We enjoy working and, um, and you know, it carries into the, to the real world where we just work a lot. I never dated an architect though, have you? Uh, no, I don't know if I could. That's, that'd be an interesting one. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm, well, I guess I, I don't, well, it depends how you define dated, but I don't, I don't know if. I never had a long-term relationship with an arch- with another architect. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Because as architects, we're very opinionated. In, and I think even sort of the, the most modest architect, deep down inside, is very opinionated. And it's going to come out <laughs> at some point, you know. All right. So number six, after a while, you will only hang out with architects. Then that, that seems to be uh, true there. Um, number... Seven. Wait a minute. The n- the numbering is wrong on the article. It is. It's ten. Yeah. <laughs> nice article. They have number six listed twice. Well, here we go. Here's six. We just did six A. Now we'll do six B. See, this is a case where she's not an architect and obviously not anal. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I can't believe I I didn't pick this up when we when we um you know first read it. Um. All right. So six B is. Architects handle relationship and life stress well. And the commentary here is because anything is less stressful than a deadline. I would totally agree with this one. I think, <laughs> I think in a pinch, you want an architect with you. You got, a, you got a big thing going on. First of all, nothing phases us, right? And it'll work out. It's fine. If it breaks, I can fix it. I can find somebody that can fix it. It's fine. Nothing is that big of a deal to me and to my friend. I mean, we, I think we're, we're natural problem solvers. So I, I think just by, our, just by our training, we're used to having things come at us. And we, that's what we do all day is we, we, you, know, you throw problems at us and we, and we correct them. So that's, that's, that's the best thing about dating us. <laughs> I wish I could say the same, but you know, I'm the one who went through a divorce a couple of years ago. So, uh, but... Um, but to your point, uh, I do think we handle, uh, I think we do handle stress well. And I think part of that is, uh, you know, going through architecture school again, architecture school, it's a big deal because it does shape a lot of whether we know it a lot or, or not, it shapes a lot of what happens in the after years. Um, we do learn to problem solve, uh, and we do learn to sort of present our problems or our, you know, solutions in architecture school. So yeah, the architects I know are definitely pretty good um, problem solvers. Uh, I wouldn't, in fact, I don't know if I know any sort of architects that are sort of I would call high maintenance in the sense of, uh, you know, reacting to everything. Now, interior designers—that's another topic. <laughs> now, I'm I'm sorry, interior designers. I just had to say that, but uh, but no, seriously, I think um, I think architects can can uh, can handle it well. And it, it might be part of that we have a pretty good um, uh, overall view of the way things go together, whatever that is, abstractly speaking. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, if you're a male architect and you're dating women, women don't like to be told the solutions. They just want to vent their problems, as I've learned. So it's not always great because it, it takes a while that, because, you know, the architect mentality would be, oh, here's, I can show you how to fix that issue that you're having in your life. Right. And uh, not everybody wants that, but yeah. but generally speaking, we, we also don't get stressed out about things because we have a constant level of stress on us all the time. We're like that beam diagram in structures where you've got you know the the load <laughs> distribution right. and a, and, a, and a little point load. Oh, we'll just we'll compensate for the little point load. It's fine. <laughs> we'll just add it with all the other uniform loads. Can you can you tell that we're working on the structures exam <laughs> stuff? <laughs> Um, all right. So, so six is true or six B is true. So number seven, this is a a good one. You won't get studio. (laughs) And the commentary is prepare yourself for constant references to this mysterious place called studio. 
that they spent every waking moment of their college lives in and never being let uh, let in on the inside jokes with explanations like you had to be there or it was a lot funnier at four in the morning. This I you know I, I met um, I met with a high school student last week who wants to go into architecture and I and his mom had set it up and and I was giving him advice on schools and stuff and then when the topic of studio came up I just took it for granted that uh, you know well that'll be your studio and he you know he said what studio and I found I had to explain studio and I I hadn't really done that in a, in a long time <laughs> and you sound like a crazy person explaining it <laughs> well. Here's this thing. You're going to have other classes, but none of them are important. <laughs> and you'll have this thing called studio, which you'll spend all of your free time in. And classes will be a distraction taking you away from studio. <laughs> As and will personal know, relationships. And hygiene and, you yeah. know, things like that. <laughs> and, I, you know, I, was, I, was, I was said, yeah, we had, you know, we had a, a, a fold-out lounge chair that we would share, and that would be the nap chair. And we had a refrigerator and a microwave. And we kept food at studio, so we wouldn't have to. You know, I'm trying to explaining this, and we sound you sound like you were in a, a POW camp <laughs> after a while, which is, I guess, what it was. And even my wife, you know, if we run into somebody I went to school with, and they start bringing up the cr- quote unquote crazy things we did at, in studio, she's bored out of her mind because she doesn't get any of those jokes, and they're not funny. They're really not funny. Yeah, and it, it is funny because they're not interested. The, the whole studio thing is not interesting to anybody else but ourselves. Um, yeah. Remember that time when you were up for 56 hours and you couldn't <laughs> stand and your legs were shaking? You almost cut your wrist off? <laughs> Remember that? Ah, it's funny. It's not to anybody. It's not, no. Uh, and it is interesting because um, studio, uh, it's a special place for all of us who uh, have survived it and some of us listening who are still in it. Um, But you think about any other sort of professional uh, degree you go after, any sort of education, nothing is quite like an architecture studio. I mean, maybe artists have some sort of studio stuff, but but certainly doctors, lawyers, I mean, they don't have any sort of studio kind of uh, environment. No. And I, I, you know, that's, that's part of it. You know, I, I think part of part of the education is being stuck with these morons at you know all night long, and <laughs> you know, and arguing over who's you know, dude, we can't play that Pink Floyd album anymore. We've heard it five <laughs> times in a row. I think that's I think that's part of part of the uh, boot camp, part of the part of the process. You know, uh, so it's it's um, you know, if you think about your fondest memories of school, they probably occurred outside of school hours. They were all you know, late night things that occurred in studio. I guess the way normal people have experiences at parties and in inside dorms that we'd missed, but you know, we have it, we have it in studio. It's the, it's the context for all of our fun college memories, isn't it? it yeah, it really is. Um, in, because it's something you go to studio and like, you don't, you forget about everything else. Um, and I think uh, admittedly, um, now 42 years old, that still happens to me. Um, like if I'm working on something, I just get so consumed by it and hours go by and, you know, um, you just forget about the outside world. You forget about all this other stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what, you know. But, you know, now at least I have, I, I'm grounded in some sort of reality because I have a, a child. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. I yeah. forgot about that. I have two of those, too. I forgot. <laughs> yeah. That, that, uh, you know, and that, I think that keeps us somewhat like, uh, well, you, we, can't go, we can't go a week straight without coming back home. You know, right. that doesn't, doesn't happen anymore. And, and you know what I think about number seven, not getting studio yeah. is uh, now that I'm thinking about it, it's almost like we don't want somebody else to get studio. Like that's our thing. Like that's us as architects. We have that. And we don't want you to understand what we do. <laughs> well, it's also, it's also a, a rite of passage because, you know, now that I teach, you know, I'm, I'm in the studio and that smell of Elmer's glue and chipboard and, you know, B.O., <laughs> is uh it's very familiar and very comforting to me in a way and it's amazing you know I'll, you know I'll, if i'm in if i'm at bac and i'm in there i'm on their the i'm you know i was in their thesis studio when i was there f- a few months ago and it's you know i, I could have just sat down at a table and started working i mean that it's very comforting 
Right. Um, yeah, which, by the way, if if you are listening to this and you're in studio and you're going on a date with somebody who's not an architect, I probably wouldn't talk too much about studio. Maybe mention a sentence about it, but that's probably it because they won't be interested. It's better not to talk about yourself really at all. That's true. Just, just ask questions. You'll, it, yeah. You'll do better. For sure. <laughs> All right, so number seven is true. You won't get studio. Number eight, they will be coffee snobs. So here's the the commentary here. If it's not organically grown, economically sustainable, and socially consciously harvested and brewed in a vintage French press or a... Is this Chimax? Chimax? I don't even know what that is. I don't even know either. Uh, chances are they might politely decline your coffee. Until four minutes later, they realize they're caffeine-deprived and ethics be damned, this presentation needs to get to Dubai by 1 (laughs) a.m. So what do we say about they will be coffee snobs? Well, you know, that's that's pretty specific. I I personally don't drink coffee, but uh, um, and I'm trying to, you know, I I haven't seen any evidence of that. I think, I think if anything, we'd be more snobby about the actual machine and how it was designed. You know, my wife has a... um, what you call it with the little K cups? I don't oh, those know. those Kruger things or those? The, uh, the, yeah, well, I don't even know the name of the stupid. Thing. It starts <laughs> with the K, right? And the little K cups. And I remember, I I chose, I bought it for her for her birthday, and I chose the model based on the design. And it looks like a Porsche. I don't know. I have no idea if it works well or not. It just looks cool because I wanted I wanted it to look good in the kitchen. And that and that gets back to our earlier point of we're thinking about these things like we're not even going to use the coffee maker, but if we have to get one for our spouse, yeah, it's got to look good in the kitchen. It's got to complement in the kitchen. So yeah, I'm going to have an opinion about it, even though I'm not going to use it. I'm having an opinion about which one we're getting. <laughs> yeah, no, I've never used it, but I, I picked it out. Uh, yeah, I would say eight is is not true. I think it's a little too specific. Uh, I used to drink a lot of coffee uh, back in Boston, certainly in architecture school. Um, I, I go through phases of not drinking it. Um, I don't drink it now. I do go to Star- I like to go to Starbucks. So I'll either do like tea or a uh, chai tea latte. Uh, but I've been off coffee for over a year, but getting to what you were talking about earlier, I think it would be uh, safe to say we're probably food snobs and a little bit about what you're talking about earlier. Like we, we like things sort of organically grown or sustainably harvested or whatever it is. We like sort of the finer foods, I guess. Yeah, and especially because of years of mistreatment in studio where I was living on Pop Tarts and Diet Coke. You know, it's <laughs> it's you know, it's now I I know that I, the, whatever I put into my body is a machine and and I need to fuel it with proper things if I'm going to keep up this endurance <laughs> test called life. Uh yes, and in case you forgot 15 minutes ago you talked about your Trader Joe's uh cookies that uh <laughs> that are At probably sustainably harvested, right? <laughs> Yeah, Trader, Trader Joe's, Trader right? Joe's. Yeah, right. That's the thing about I love Trader Joe's. Uh, that's where I do all of my shopping, and they just they have a way of presenting their stuff uh, over like where the frozen foods are, all like the cookies and dark chocolate. And there's something about looking at them, and I try not to buy them because I'll eat the whole thing in one night. But there's something about the, the way it's presented, like it's good for you because it's well, Trader it's all, Joe's. It's all, it's all at eye level too, right? Ah, right. oh, they're, they're brilliant. All right, so eight is not true. They will be coffee snobs. All right, nine, the last one here is architects are passionate, dedicated people. And the commentary here is they didn't get through five years of architecture school by being lazy, indifferent, and stupid. Need a first conversation a date starter? Ask them about how many people dropped out of their program freshman year. They'll be all too proud to tell you that they were one of the few who made it out unscathed. They know just enough about every cultural relevant. By the way, I love this part that I'm uh, that I'm reading now because this is definitely true. But they know just enough about every culturally relevant artist, philosopher, composer, etc., to make them seem exceptionally worldly and cultured. Your parents should love them. This is the part I love. Keep in mind that it's all a facade. And that if you were to press them on any one of those topics, they'll find a way to skillfully manipulate the conversation into some abstract concept and avoid being called out on not knowing shit. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, that, that one's probably pretty true. <laughs> 
but you know that's good it's good to you know to know a lot about or know a little about everything i guess but but to know a lot of subjects and uh and being passionate is always a good thing in fact i think we could stand to use a little more of it yeah you know i think what's what's interesting about it is i think we as architects we are curious um and um we, you know we like to know a lot about us a, a lot of stuff um you know I mean, they they have said this uh, for a long time. It's one of my favorite expressions. I heard it, I think, in architecture school. Um, I think one of the history teachers basically said, architecture is the mother of all arts. And when you think about it, it is. I mean, everything else sort of spills down from architecture. And you look at sort of history through the ages, it's all sort of defined by uh, the architecture and the architectural movement and what was going on. Uh, with the architecture time period, and then everything sort of uh, funnels down from there. Exactly. I, uh, um, you know, I, I think it it also shows that, um, that, you know, with my friends, my architect friends, I know that there's certain topics I could bring up, and just to push their buttons and get them on a get them on a rant about something. You know, I, <clears throat> I know, I know, I have a friend Jeff. If I bring up a certain musician he'll just go off on like here's why he was a genius and he'll just start going and with my other friend mal i can talk about a certain painter and he'll just go you know if i really dug in deep I, yeah maybe he wouldn't know as much as he should but uh you know it's still we're fun people to talk to no i, I yeah i think what it is is that the, the the sort of perception of what this person wrote about number nine is that um that will pretend to know a, a lot about a lot and, you know, obviously you can't know a lot about a lot, but we'll know a lot about, you know, several things, but not everything we proclaim, you know, to be like, you know, we can't know everything about sort of the history of sort of architecture, but we'll make you think like we do. Right. Yeah. But there are things that we know a lot about that we like, I, I know way too much about concrete admixtures, you know, <laughs> that's it's taking a valuable space in my head that could be like my, my anniversary, you know, that's, that, that yes. doesn't fit in there because because I know about waterproofing and, you know, and other things that probably I could erase in the yeah, hard drive. Yeah, probably remembering some birthday dates or, you know, where you met right. your wife, that kind of stuff. Right. Um, but, yeah, we're definitely passionate. We're definitely dedicated. And I guess I would probably add to number nine, we're opinionated. You know, we're, you know, we, we just, just, we're opinionated. So, is that, does that make us good to date? I mean, we, given these nine slash ten things... I think we're a catch, um, but I'm biased here, you know. Um, yeah, and in uh, in this article doesn't really have sort of, uh, uh, I guess, a viewpoint other than to present these nine or actually what now we just found out are, are ten points. Um, she left one off. Though. What was that one? That uh, <clears throat> the common perception is that we always all wear black. That's one that comes up for me a lot. That is true. That's not on here. It should be on there. It but should it, but, totally be on there. But uh, I don't. I don't wear black as much as I'd like to because I have a child, and it shows every bit of lint and hair. <laughs> so Good I point. Can't, I, I can't anymore. But I have a kid with a big wild mane of hair, and it's uh, full of fur balls. So you know, I, I I would have hair over me all the time, very visible. But but I would I would wear. I would be like Johnny Cash if I could. Everything would be just black and. You know, I remember living in Boston. Um, Boston, we did wear a lot of black, and, and certainly in New York. I mean, New York wear a lot of black. And then I moved to L.A. I mean, people still wear black in L.A., but the, it, it's to the point now where if you see somebody wearing black in L.A., it's like, oh, you you moved from New York. You know, exactly, it's, yeah. Because uh, the people wear, like, T-shirts and flip-flops, and it's a little more carefree. I mean, I just, I just started getting T-shirts with prints on them now. I've gra- I graduated from just you know, solid color t-shirt. So it's, it's baby steps. First it was all black. Then I was like, okay, let me get some solid color t-shirts. And now I've actually taken the big step to get t-shirts that actually have prints on them. So, yeah. but I had, I had a studio professor, uh, uh, Roy was, his, I forget his last name, but he wore all black and black on black, like black shirt with black jacket and black tie. And he looked great. And he had these big black rim glasses. Uh, but he, you know, it's, it, it all, it was that was the eighties, of course. So he kind of looks like a caricature of well, himself by now. 
You know, it's funny you mention that because when I took um, the orals uh, here in California back in, in 2007, and for those of those for those of you who don't know yet, once you get once you pass your seven AREs here in California, they say it's not good enough. Uh, you have to take our one test. So uh, the California supplemental exam, which is now uh, computer based, but when I took it, it was oral, and you go in front of three architects. And the guy on my right, I'll never forget, he was this older gentleman. And he could have been, he didn't look like Johnny Cash, but he could have been Johnny. All black, he had like whatever that little medallion thing and that little thing hanging down, what's that called? Oh, bolo tie? No, no, it wasn't a tie. It was like a, a, like a gem thing here and it's got a little thing hanging down. There's a term for it. Uh, cheesy? No, no, it's not. No, it's not cheesy. Uh uh, I forget what it is, but he was just all black, and he he really liked me, and all three of them, you know, stood up and shook my hand. But I just remember, like, th- this was the guy that you would think came right out of the '80s, just like you said, you know. There, you know, uh, it, I, there are a lot of black black clad architects, I imagine, but I think now we've we've uh, at the very least we've graduated to shades of gray. Maybe <laughs> maybe that's kind of a safer way to put it. I think we've graduated to fifty shades of gray. <laughs> Which which I did, which I have not read the book, but everyone else has uh, seemed to. Have you read Fifty Shades of Grey? No, but my wife did, and she she's probably going to be mad that I'm admitting this. But she first of all, she hated it. She thought it was poorly written, ah. and didn't didn't know what all the fuss was about. And really, it's a very that's a whole other discussion because it taps into this whole Freudian thing where people are kind of uh, you know they're kind of pent up and right and and not releasing their their inner desire. And I think the book just the reason it sold billions of copies is because of that but i think for normal people who are open about themselves and what they like it, it, they won't be impressed i feel like i should i, I and may, maybe i will i have some books from audible i need to get but maybe i'll maybe i'll read it or listen to it in audible just so i can feel like i'm participating in pop culture <laughs> but <laughs> but the point i brought that up is i saw um picture of somebody's halloween costume which i thought was pretty good it was they were 50 shades of gray and they had like the paint you know chips 50 shades of gray like paint chips all around them and attached to their body i thought that was pretty good and they were 50 shades of gray i that, that's that is good there's a there's a tv show called um how i met your mother and uh i i never really see it but i've seen it but i don't watch it regularly but the one of the main characters ted is an architect <clears throat> and he is he is playing up in every stereotype of architects. He's a bit of a know-it-all. They kind of tease him about it. He gets really heated and passionate about certain things. And I, as as much as I like, don't like being reduced to a stereotype, it's fairly true. I mean, it's, he <laughs> see, he seems like me and all of my friends, basically. Well, that is. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's another um, sort of um, let's call them bubblegum topics for sake of anything else. But but how architects are perceived in the movies, I think that would be a great uh, podcast. Uh, oh, I, there's a, I've, I have a great list of movies that we could do that on. And, you know, there's there's on the one end of the spectrum, there's the Fountainhead, Howard Rourke. Right. And that perception. Gary Cooper, of course, playing this, you know, like carved out of chiseled out of stone kind of guy. And at the other end, there's, you know, Ted from How I Met Your Mother, who's right. kind of a bit, a bit of a doofus. Which I think, and I've and I read some Hollywood lists over the years and stuff, but people seem to forget. And uh, and we don't want to reveal too much about this, whatever we're going to do for the upcoming uh, episode. But people forget Steve McQueen. Uh, not, I'm sorry, not Steve McQueen. Paul Newman in The Towering Inferno, 1976-77 disaster movie. Paul Newman was the architect and Steve McQueen was the chief firefighter. And they were at odds. And, and you know... Uh, um, uh, Steve McQueen, you know, was upset at Paul Newman because you architects just keep building these things higher and higher, you know, but, you know, nobody, I think people forgot that uh, Paul Newman was an architect in the Towering Inferno. I did so forget that. Yeah, right. It's a good one. So we'll, we're going to save that for another episode. Uh, I will I, I will say, though, that Anthony Quinn, do you remember the actor Anthony Quinn? Yeah. Young, younger people won't remember him. He was Zorba the Greek. Yeah. Yeah. He went to Taliesin and met with Frank Lloyd Wright. He wanted to be an architect. Really? And Mr. Wright said to him, Tony, you're so dramatic. Have you considered acting? <laughs> and went into acting because, because of Mr. Wright. And that is a true story. I've gotten that from many Taliesin apprentices. Have you really? Yeah, that's kind of a nice bit of trivia. 
That is a great piece of trivia. Tony, you're so dramatic. Go and you should go in acting. And he and he did. From so Frank Lloyd Wright, no less. From you know? Frank Lloyd Wright himself. <laughs> that is pretty good. All right, so that's going to wrap up our list here. I'm just going to run it, run through. Number one, architects make a lot of money. Not true. Number two, architects are used to late nights. True. Three, there is no such thing as a fat architect. Not true. Four, things you never even knew existed are now the most important thing ever. True. Five, they're probably anal. I say true. Eric disagrees. He's in denial. Number six, after a while, you will only hang out with architects. I think we said that one was true. Yeah, it's pretty true. Six B, architects handle relationship life stress well. True. Number seven, you won't get studio. True. Eight, they will be coffee snobs. Not true. And nine, architects are passionate, dedicated people. True. There you have it. There is the list, Eric. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to the A.R.E. Podcast. Be sure to visit architectexamprep.com and check out our other podcast episodes, video tips, and the A.R.E. blog. Remember to plan, practice, and pass.